So moving on with that theme of, of owning your customer experience, um, Ian Williams is going to talk to you now about marketing to the machine. We talked in the introduction uh, very much about how customers are starting to utilize technology to kind of sit between them and uh, the advertisers, um, and also how we're allowing machines to start to communicate with our customers. So Ian's going to give you a little bit of insight into what we're seeing in that space as well. That was a bad time to do that. <laughs> Cheers, mate. No problem. Cool. Um, yeah, so thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm Ian. I work here uh, in iProspect and Leeds. I'm an associate director, um, so thank you all for coming. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about apps, chatbots, and voice AI. Now, I've, in my notes preparing this, I said that they were existing on a fairly grand term, which I called a continuum of maturity, which uh, is quite fantastic. But I'm going to, I've said it, I'm going to disqualify that. It's a journey through where those different products and services are. Because to me, and to generally the way I would say it, they are solving a shared challenge, which is how do we communicate with our customers in digital environments. Apps, you know, the way I would say it with apps is that the gold rush in many ways is over. Anyone who worked in our industry in that period of time where let's get an app, we need an app. Everybody needs an app, let's have an app. We need more apps, ideally let's have lots of apps. Because you, know, you could stake a claim in a, in a marketplace that was quite open at the time. That's not the case anymore. There are 4 million apps globally across the two main app stores, um, 3,000 getting added every day. So in the space of this whole day, we've probably had about 1,500 apps added that weren't here at the very start of the day. If you're a developer, it's also true. You, know, you can't, we can't live this dream of being the next Angry Birds creator. This, this is gone. This, this time has passed. And what we see increasingly is people leaving those digital experiences through apps. 50% of apps have been abandoned since 2015. I think, and this is really bad data, by the way, but this is anecdotal data. But I think collectively, we, were, we are probably using fewer apps now than we did when we first got our smartphones, when there was lots of gimmicks, lots of novelties, exciting uses of accelerometers and the technology that all existed. What we want instead is a good experience from our apps. So if you look at a company like Facebook, they're pushing updates to their platforms about every 45 days or every month and a half. They're using methodologies like Agile with capital A, Scrum, different things like that to deliver incremental value to their users. On the other hand, we've got 328,000 apps that haven't been updated in three years. So there's a clear distinction between good and bad, essentially. Because you know, apps are apps are complicated. There's more to them. I think it's probably quite difficult to uh, see because the perils of bright brand colors. Um, but you know, obviously, you have your build. Everyone's aware of that, that kind of upfront expenditure, but you have operating expenditures too. You have, you have to consider things like analytics and attribution. So how am I going to join all of this data together? You've got to think about your platforms and technology that's plugging into that. That's just your build. Then you've got maintenance, which, as we saw before, is where people are kind of falling off. So updates to your operating system, bug fixes, security fixes, and you know, improvements too. Let's not just forget about taking advantage of or dealing with the bad things. There's always opportunities. So example before of Warby Parker, you've got new technology that was available. So how do you use that to make a better experience in your app to create a product differentiation? And then you've got marketing. And you know, we are a marketing company. So broadly speaking, we would say that on average, this sort of for every pound that you invest in the build of your app, you're going to need to spend another two in marketing. It's, then you've got your maintenance costs as well. So the position around apps is more complex than maybe some of us originally think. So they come with the challenges. This is, this is the point. We have a challenge around reach because it's a congested marketplace. How do we cut through? Why would people come to my app? How do I get through to those people? And how do I manage that experience too? How do I maintain it and improve it and optimize it? And there's another one which isn't on here, but it's fairly critical, which is utility. Um, if we don't think about marketers who want to try the latest things and do the latest exciting things, we've got to think about ourselves as consumers. Why would I use your app? For what reason? Like mobile responsive technology and design has moved on so much. What is the, what is the reason for your app to actually exist? Are you going to spam me with push notifications to pull me back in? Because that's not really an ideal thing. Are you going to constantly offer me product discounts and vouchers and so harm the profitability of your business? What's the reason for your app to exist? If you can answer that, that's great. But in many cases, it's a difficult question to answer. And that's kind of reflected in the stat that 80% of users' time is spent in just three applications. One of those apps would be a messaging platform. 
So we look at, again, this is, apologies, it's difficult to see. This is kind of a story that we're seeing again so throughout today. So the your, your most popular global messenger apps as of the start of this year, you know, at a global level, we've got WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, and then beneath that, you've got WeChat and QQ, both owned by Tencent and now with China. WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger lead the way. Within the US, you've got Facebook Messenger at the, at the top, Snapchat, I think this is before whichever one of the Kardashians destroyed Snapchat, I can't remember. Uh, I'm not up on, I will, I will happily, happily celebrate the fact that I don't know my Kardashians. Um, so you've got, <laughs> sorry. But in the UK, it's more balanced picture. So the, the split there is a, is a darker color there, which looks like a darker green on these screens. So Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp kind of neck and neck, which is a pretty good position for Facebook to be in. Snapchat's uh, kind of just falling off a bit there. And again, that's the same in mobile reach. I mean, look at the numbers. Look at the, don't just look at the, the shapes, look at the numbers. We've got 56.8% in the US. We've got 43% in the UK and 39% for WhatsApp. These are where people are. And this growth is, it's not slowing. It's a nice graph if you work for either of these businesses, but essentially this growth and acquisition of users is growing and growing and growing. We're not seeing that slow down. The way in which people use it, on the left we have WhatsApp and on the right we have Facebook Messenger, and we can see that obviously Facebook is kind of, there's a balance to how we use it. Different people are using it in different ways. WhatsApp is much more heavily focused around the using it multiple times a day. I mean, we're coordinating a lot of stuff today through WhatsApp. Um, which you probably wouldn't do through Facebook Messenger because of you know, the fact it requires your, your Facebook connection to Facebook rather than your mobile phone number, and it's just the nature of the network. But either way, they're astonishing figures, the, act, the activity on these platforms. So if we forget about technology and we actually just think about how do we, how do we interact with our customers, those shared digital experiences, Messenger bots and working in messenger platforms provides a number of opportunities. It's kind of, it's seen as exciting, it's dressed up as exciting. Um, but actually, I'm going to argue a couple of points on that because, <coughs> pardon me, that was a bad thing to do. Uh, from a point of view of whether or not it's complex, it sounds complex, it sounds you know, kind of futuristic. I'd argue that it's actually easier. You're leveraging a platform that already exists. It seems that it's innovative because it's exciting and new and you know, there's not that many people doing these types of things. I'd argue it's actually a pragmatic decision because the reach is handled, the frequency is handled. All I need to do is focus on the experience, which, you know, one of three, I'll take that. The other argument is that it's cutting edge and that it's new. And I would argue, well, if anybody ever spent time trying to write a letter in Microsoft Word in the 1990s, uh, that makes me feel a little bit old, but there we go. Um, he was always there to help me in his various forms, Clippy. It could be cat as well, if I remember. Um, so things have moved on since Clippy. We have these kind of, you know, the, 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 we're talking about processing large volumes of data. We're talking about understanding semantic relationships. And also, I think, really importantly, grasping that words mean concepts and words mean items. And we need to understand what items are. And this is all possible now. Uh, and it's only increasing. So within the kind of the space of Facebook, we have... 2 billion monthly messengers between users and the businesses, 36,000 bots on Messenger, which is you know, quite a steep uptake, but it's still, you know, it's still early doors in this space, really. And the people who do message businesses, the vast majority of them are saying that they are doing that more. We don't see any reason why that will change. So coming back to the kind of the fundamental challenge of us as marketers, it's to be in the right place at the right time. And we know from the usage stats that so many people and so many of our markets and our customers are already in these spaces. They are taking part in this. They are increasingly exhibiting the behaviors of people who are willing to interact with these platforms. As we've heard earlier, the platforms can do more things than we previously thought. So we can transact. We can start to trade money. We can pay for things. We can arrange things. We can do all kinds of different things through platforms that we couldn't do previously. We can see that here in some of these stats from some global case studies, so about a 4% increase, uh, increase in conversion through to booking a test drive for a car. So how do you curate the sort of exploration process for customers when they're looking for a car? We can increase install reservations. And we generally just see across the board this, again, this is another word. I didn't come up with this word, but this is conversational commerce. Um, and the idea is that people are increasingly happy to interact with brands in this way through their existing messenger platforms because that's where they are and we can work with them in those places. 
you don't have to, of course, use that type of technology and that type of conversational approach within just those platforms. You can, of course, build that functionality into your own app. They work. The fundamental point is that the technology, the process, the idea of using an automated chat solution is it works because your customers are essentially time poor. I am, so I've, I've always felt, I think, relatively uncomfortable with the, with, well, whenever I get an unexpected item in my bagging area, that type of automation frustrates me sometimes, but I keep finding myself going towards it because, you know what, sometimes I don't want to talk to people and sometimes I just want to do this quickly and get, get my stuff and get out of the shop. And you know what, there's a number of studies as well that say that people buy things differently when they don't have to take it to the person at the till as well. So there's some interesting things there. This can exist inside an app of your own. This is the Gartner hype cycle, which if you haven't seen it, it's worth it's worth looking at at least for its grand names of the stages in its charts, which I think we should all take a lesson from. Um, it charts out the sort of the hype and the talk around new technology. So you see this very quick spike where we see, which reaches the wonderfully titled peak of inflated expectations. This is where we think these, this technology, whatever technology it may be, is going to change the world. It's going to do everything that we ever thought it could do. That then lapses pretty quickly into the trough of disillusionment, where we realize that's not the case. It's not really done anything. Um, it just made me spend a bit of money. Um, then we go to the slope of enlightenment and then move to the plateau of productivity, where the technology actually finds a home in society. A good example of that would be Google Glass. So that started very quickly. You know, all of a sudden, it was all over the news. It was everywhere, despite the fact I think I saw maybe two, 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 sort of two models in the wild. Um, but it kind of it, it was everywhere across a lot of tech news, a lot of marketing news. How is it? How are we going to do this? It's going to change everything. Where is it now? Well, it, it didn't change that much actually. It didn't really do as what we thought it would do. So it kind of plunged into the trough of disillusionment. But it did find a home in manufacturing. The technology will find us home in many different products and services still to come. So that's when it's on the plateau of productivity. The point is that when it comes to new technology, we need to not be blinded by what's possible, but actually find out what's effective, where, where are our customers, and how can we actually engage with them? Because there is a lot of hype. I mean, you know, voice and AI, if we think about these things, Amazon Alexa was the top selling product on Amazon in all categories, I think US and UK, uh, Christmas 2017. I went to my sister's house on Christmas Day, and uh, my nephew, was enjoying asking it for all the capital cities of the world and playing music. It was a fantastic experience for us all. Um, he, uh, he loves that. Um, as my girlfriend said, though, I'm not having that bloody woman in the house. Um, so <laughs> but the, uh, the other stat that I like, actually, about this is that the, the most downloaded app on both main Play stores and app stores on Christmas Day, which is the interesting thing, was the Amazon Echo Skills app as well. So you can see why people are buying this thing. You can see where this is on that, comparing back to that hype cycle, that it's, there's a lot of noise about this stuff. The skills are growing, so it's 24,000 skills on Alexa, 10 million unit sales. But I think the one in yellow, which is Google moving into the space, is the most interesting one, because actually the fact that Google moved into that space is a, you could argue, is a defensive move. They didn't want to cede the space of voice search and assistance to, to Amazon exclusively became it's a revealing thing. So you can see the way that the two businesses are playing out, because we do think that stuff is going to happen in this space. Whether or not it is at the moment, though, is kind of the question. Because behavior on these platforms is frequent. We've got the majority of people are using the device at least once a day. But much like my nephew, they're using it to play music or to ask for information uh, or you know, weather queries. It's nothing at the moment that's changing the world, I suppose. And that's largely due to what we would call sort of valueless skills that exist on these platforms. And this is where it mirrors apps. This is why I said they're on a continuum. Because, and I apologize here, but the, uh, the ones that's highlighted there, or one of them, is uh, the skill Alexa, ask for a fart, um, which is not really, you know, fair to my, my own hype cycle, it's not really changing my world. I think my nephew might think that is the sort of the killer app he's been waiting for all his life. I would argue that it's probably not for me. So this is very reminiscent of apps. You know, when we had, again, referring back to the technology that existed in mobile phones, we had accelerometers. So we had that app where you could drink a pint of beer, and it was fantastic. It was really exciting. And then we used it twice and then uninstalled it. But we were using accelerometers to do cool things. We can now use 
that technology in Google Maps, augmented reality, and lots of other interesting things. So there's kind of the cycle that we're going on because ultimately these, these when it comes to assistance, when it comes to chatbots, it's coming, it's exciting, but it's early days. And I think this video proves that quite well. Play digger digger. Lada, play digger digger. Bobby, can you talk to play wheel? You want to hear a station for porn detected. Porno ringtone. No. Hot chick amateur girl quiet no, sexy. No, no, no. 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 Hot pussy okay. anal dildo ringtone. Alexa, girl. stop. Um, sorry, sorry. I, uh, I have no idea what was going on. So that's a question for the Amazon talk later. Um, sorry. <laughs> but I love the mad scramble. No! Um, this is happening. It is going to happen. It's not quite there yet. If I was going to say takeaways, I think that specifically to the search market, where we obviously do a lot of work, you're looking for a shift in keyword terms. You're looking at longer, tame, longer tail terms, more conversational queries. You should be looking to structure your data and get everything there in place so that in future it's, you're ready to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, it's gonna, it is going to change things. So every brand guideline that I've ever read talks about tone of voice as a sort of abstract concept. It's a real thing here. It's a bit like the 1930s and received pronunciation. And how do, you, how do you know that you're listening to the BBC when you flick the dial? Well, this is very similar to that too. So that's kind of, it is going to change the way that we use as consumers, that we use digital channels. Um, but it's not quite there yet. So if there's a takeaway that I've got from this, I think it's to say, let's not be so excited by what we can do or what we could do in the future or be so predictable to do what we've always done and build apps. Let's actually think about where our customers are today and making the most of those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. So. A few interesting topics that kind of took us on a bit of a journey through kind of um, through voice, through chatbots, through apps, through customer experience generally. If it's a broad range, I guess the second part is, is kind of starting to bring to life some of the stuff that we can do when we get our data strategy right. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask Ian in relation to those topics and themes that we've covered in that talk? Do you have one over here? I've got the mic. <laughs> Is it mic coming? No. No? Anybody else? It's your opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> right at the back. Um, given the point that was made uh, regarding responsive websites and the fact that why do we need an app if sites are more responsive, et cetera. Is it likely that the use of apps will decline as the speed and uh, quality of our phone connection increases? Because at present, the experience of opening a website on many phones in average situations is pretty crap because you've got a seven, 10 second delay in the damn thing to load. So as we get 5G, 6G, whatever comes next, um, will that cause the death of apps? Death of apps. Um, I, I think that so 5G will come along, and what we'll do is we'll create more complicated websites, more complicated adverts, so it'll still load as slowly as always did. It'll run like the Red Queen. The thing that I would say is more interesting is if you can look that, um, you know, I'd argue that there are aspects of the web and the infrastructure that sits behind the web, the way that we build websites um, that have been kind of played out between media providers is a bit of a bit of a squabbling ground in some ways. So Google's Accelerated mobile pages became, you know, that was a response to the fact that people moving to consume content through Apple and potentially through Facebook too. So that was going to directly harm Google's revenue stream. Now they're trying to push out AMP as a kind of general standard for a lot of websites as well. And they're trying to develop that as some way off. Um, that would be more likely to create the kind of situation where people are more likely to shop, uh, more likely to use a responsive website than an app. But I would say that, you know, it's still possible to. I mean, yes, loading speed is a huge thing. So it's a huge inf influence on conversions. So at the very least, you know, you can make your, there's probably very few businesses here, there's probably very few businesses anywhere, really, that could not make their mobile website work a bit faster anyway. And if you can do that, then you start to reduce the necessity 
for a separate experience unless it has a specific reason to exist. And that's kind of my argument. It's not to say that there's no need for apps, but it's to say that unless your app is adding something truly valuable, truly, truly unique that you couldn't do through the website, why would I use it? Does that answer your question? I, I can't yeah. really see you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. cool. Any more questions? One right at the back up there. Hi, Ian. Um, I was wondering if you think that there's any danger of negativity from, from chatbots. So something like Alexa, people, it's fairly obvious you're talking to a machine, you're talking to a device, but something like a, a company's instant messenger or chatbot, is there a danger of negativity if someone, if it becomes obvious that they are being spoken to by a machine and perhaps they naively think they're speaking to a real person and could the negative sentiment from that outweigh the values of the immediacy of doing it? Um, yeah, I would argue that I don't, I don't see the data at the moment that says that we need to pretend that it's not a chatbot. I don't, I'm not trying to say that we should use that technology and pretend that it's a real person. Actually, I think we can be fairly open about this is a process that's going to take you a certain, period, a certain way across the journey that you're on as a customer. You know, in some markets, it's not going to take you all the way. Certain services, it's probably not even appropriate. But in some cases, it will be. And I, I mean, I think if we all had the choice between interacting with a, a messenger chatbot for a very simple query, or so if I could manage pet hate, password research for digital applications through my bank, right? So if that happens and I get locked out, I'm completely shut out and I have to call them up and I'm on hold because I'm in hold with everybody else that's trying to get a mortgage, everybody else that's trying to manage this, 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 this and this, and I just really want to reset my password and move some money around. If I could do that through a chatbot, you've got the scalability of customer service because that's something that exists 24-7. You don't have to hire more people to manage that. You don't have to hire more people because you're running a TV campaign and you're going to have more calls coming in. You can just run that all the time. Now, I would say in that case, that's something that could be automated. I wouldn't say that that would be detrimental to the customer experience, and I wouldn't say it's something that we should seek to hide either. I think we could be open about the fact that that's a chatbot and that's an experience that you're having there in that way. Thanks. Got time for one more if anybody's got another question? No. No more? Okay. Well, thanks very much, Ian. Thanks Thank for you. that. Cheers. <laughs>